This is an emergency summit. I'm Varsha Gandhikota Nalutla from the Progressive International, speaking to you from India. In our country today, the stakes of this pandemic are in front of our eyes, on our streets. People are literally gasping for air as the virus takes hold of their bodies. A year and a half into this crisis, we as the world have no plan to end the pandemic. In this moment, every laboratory, every factory, every scientist and every healthcare worker must be empowered to produce and deliver more vaccines for everyone, everywhere. Instead, high and middle income countries have used up more than 85% of the vaccine supply of the world. Many have done nothing to waive patent monopolies on vaccines. None of them have done anything to force a transfer of vaccine technology to the world. Their actions are condemning millions to their deaths. As we speak, the virus is mutating. New variants of concern continue to accelerate the virus's assault. The alpha variant in the UK, the beta in South Africa, gamma in Brazil, and now delta in India. Every minute that global cooperation is delayed is another neighborhood of lives at risk. We cannot seriously expect a few rich country governments to challenge a global health system that they constructed, nor can we wait around for fresh promises of charity. Our very survival is at stake. Our lives and liberty are in danger and the sovereignty of the South is called into question. That is why we're convening this emergency summit for vaccine internationalism. Today and over the weekend, political leaders, government ministers, vaccine manufacturers and healthcare worker unions, we will hear from all of them on how to end the pandemic. These progressive forces are coming together to set the stage for a new kind of politics where solidarity is more than a slogan. The goal of the summit is simple, to share, produce and distribute COVID-19 vaccines for the world and end the pandemic. I welcome and celebrate the formation of this new fighting alliance today. Together, we shall write a new international health order. Buen día con todos y con todas. Mi nombre es Karina Vance Mafla y soy ex ministra de Salud del Ecuador y ex directora del Instituto de Gobierno en Salud de la UNASUR. Es un honor poder participar de la Cumbre por el Internacionalismo de las Vacunas, organizada por la Internacional Progresista. Saludo a las autoridades presentes y líderes progresistas que hacen parte de esta cumbre, a sus organizadoras, así como a quienes nos escuchan el día de hoy, con gran expectativa sobre las acciones, propuestas y soluciones que sabemos solo pueden nacer de la voluntad política de hacer las cosas bajo los principios de solidaridad y justicia social. La actual pandemia desnudó el nivel al que están dispuestos a llegar los representantes de ciertos países, las élites económicas y las grandes empresas farmacéuticas para proteger sus intereses. Han valorado más las ganancias y la concentración de la riqueza que la vida humana. Esta pandemia de por sí presenta enormes desafíos a los sistemas de salud a nivel mundial por sus características de transmisibilidad y letalidad. Sin embargo, los problemas más grandes que se han generado han sido por fríos cálculos, por decisiones bien pensadas, no solo por errores. Una política del sálvese quien pueda, sabiendo de antemano quiénes se iban a salvar. Durante esta pandemia se han agrandado las ya existentes inequidades en nuestras sociedades. Crecen las brechas entre los más ricos y los más pobres, entre las zonas urbanas y las zonas rurales, entre quienes el actual sistema global ha favorecido con acceso a la vacuna y quienes están esperando un turno sin saber si algún día vendrá. Crecen las barreras de acceso a la salud, sobre todo para las mujeres, los pueblos indígenas y afrodescendientes, las personas migrantes, las diversidades sexuales y de identidad de género, las personas con discapacidad, entre otros. Se confirma que para muchos hay vidas humanas, sobre todo en el sur global, que son descartadas. Las vidas perdidas por la pandemia son irreparables y nos han causado un dolor inconsolable. Pero las vidas humanas que se han perdido por las decisiones y acciones que resultaron en el acaparamiento de las vacunas en los países más ricos, dejando al sur global ante una verdadera crisis, esas vidas humanas no solo nos causan dolor, sino que nos obligan a trabajar de manera más inteligente, más estratégica y más dedicada por la soberanía sanitaria del sur global. 
Solo nuestras acciones conjuntas nos permitirán salir de esta crisis y evitar que algo como esto se vuelva a repetir. Ya lo vivimos en el inicio de la pandemia, el acaparamiento de equipos de protección personal como mascarillas y otras tecnologías sanitarias. Lo vemos ahora con las vacunas. ¿Qué nos hace pensar que este cruel escenario no se volverá a repetir una y otra vez? Está en nuestras manos cambiar el rumbo de nuestro destino. Generar alternativas para el acceso a vacunas requiere decisión política, con gobiernos que trabajen por el interés público, con un énfasis en el fortalecimiento de nuestras capacidades de investigación, innovación y producción de tecnologías sanitarias, incluyendo vacunas tomando en cuenta nuestro propio perfil epidemiológico. Es alentadora la propuesta de exención del acuerdo sobre los ASPIC que se discute en la Organización Mundial del Comercio, pero varios países arrastran sus pies. Serán bienvenidas las donaciones de vacunas recientemente anunciadas en la cumbre del G7, pero sabemos que, si bien esto podrá salvar vidas, será insuficiente y no cambiará en nada el sistema global que permite que se den las enormes injusticias que hemos evidenciado desde el inicio de la pandemia. Esta cumbre puede ser, debe ser, el inicio de un proceso colectivo de gobiernos, organizaciones y liderazgos progresistas para generar una alternativa internacionalista para el acceso a las vacunas. Tenemos países en el sur global con enormes avances en el campo de la ciencia y la innovación, países que han producido sus propias vacunas, Países que tienen gran capacidad de manufactura. Todo esto en un contexto enormemente adverso. En algunos casos, pese a estar sufriendo fuertes agresiones unilaterales desde el norte. Tenemos la oportunidad de generar una plataforma que permita articular los esfuerzos de gobiernos progresistas del sur global para generar soluciones tangibles y urgentes que permitan el goce pleno del derecho a la salud que tenemos todas y todos los habitantes de este planeta. Tengo confianza que esta cumbre progresista y la plataforma que se lanza el día de hoy aportarán a sacudirnos de un sistema global profundamente colonialista y generar soluciones soberanas y efectivas para lograr el acceso universal a las vacunas, el fortalecimiento de nuestros sistemas de salud y la integración de nuestros pueblos. Muchas gracias. Buenos días, un gusto saludarlas, saludarlos a todos y todas. En primer lugar, quisiera agradecer la invitación para participar en esta cumbre por el internacionalismo de las vacunas. Nunca como antes se percibió la importancia que tienen las vacunas para la salud pública eh, en relación al beneficio individual y al beneficio colectivo que generan y la necesidad de garantizar en forma oportuna, justa y equitativa estos insumos críticos que salvan siempre millones de vidas y en este contexto, en esta pandemia, se ha evidenciado como nunca antes. Sabemos que hoy nuestra región enfrenta uno de los momentos más críticos de la pandemia y cada uno de los países de nuestra región se ha preparado y ha trabajado muchísimo para dar la mejor respuesta posible a esta situación inédita. Argentina ha fortalecido su sistema de salud una vez que se empezó a vislumbrar la posibilidad de tener vacunas allá por junio, cuando ya se desarrollaban los ensayos clínicos. Argentina empezó a trabajar fuertemente con los laboratorios productores de las vacunas candidatas, sabiendo que la grave desigualdad en el acceso a las vacunas e insumos estratégicos iba a suceder por más esfuerzos que se hicieran, por más declaraciones que hiciera Argentina en relación a la liberación de las patentes, a los derechos de uso, a lo que significa el acceso equitativo eh, en, en función de, de los riesgos y no eh, el acceso en función de las posibilidades económicas. Argentina considera que garantizar el acceso equitativo a los medicamentos y a las vacunas debe ser una prioridad de todos los estados. Resulta una condición necesaria para promover el efectivo goce del derecho a la salud para todas las personas. 
Nuestro país se ha comprometido en vacunar al 100% de su población en forma progresiva, escalonada, en función del riesgo por edad, por la condición de riesgo o por la exposición al virus. Eh, desde ese punto de vista hemos trabajado con todos los proveedores para conseguir la mayor cantidad de vacunas lo antes posible. Se han celebrado contratos bilaterales, se han celebrado contratos con el mecanismo COVAX y se sigue trabajando para tener más y mejores oportunidades para nuestro país hemos trabajado realmente con todas las opciones y seguimos trabajando. Hemos llegado en Argentina a las 20 millones de vacunas. El presidente recibió el embarque que hizo que llegáramos a los 20 millones de vacunas. En relación a la vacunación tenemos en Argentina más del 85% de la población mayor de 60 años vacunada. Más del 60% de las personas entre 50 y 55 años que ha iniciado su vacunación. En los dos casos iniciado su vacunación. Tenemos alrededor del 30% de las personas mayores que han recibido su segunda dosis y estamos trabajando para vacunar más rápido a la mayor cantidad de personas y completar los esquemas de vacunación de nuestra población. Aún así, a pesar de ese esfuerzo, las barreras para el acceso a las vacunas eh, contra el SARS-CoV-2, contra la COVID-19, continúan. Son barreras legales, son barreras eh, de producción, son barreras de inequidad en el acceso porque hay países que eh, han comprado y tienen más dosis que las de su población y bueno, son eh, dificultades eh, comunes que hoy se agudizan y se hacen muy muy visibles. Tenemos que redoblar los esfuerzos para identificar las vías adecuadas que posibiliten la transferencia de tecnología, el licenciamiento de los derechos de propiedad intelectual, que nos permitan aumentar la producción regional de vacunas e insumos esenciales. Nuestra región puede hacerlo, necesitamos que se genere el marco, organizarnos y poder trabajar en pos de eso. Necesitamos ampliar la producción nacional para formar parte de esta cadena de producción de vacunas que ha sido una decisión estratégica de nuestro gobierno para favorecer el acceso no solo de Argentina, sino de toda la región. Argentina produce la sustancia activa de la vacuna de AstraZeneca que se produce en Latinoamérica para Latinoamérica, produce, formula la vacuna Sputnik B para también la mirada de Latinoamérica y seguimos trabajando para ser parte de la cadena de producción. Nosotros contamos con una industria farmacéutica reconocida, con 190 plantas de producción, 160 son capitales nacionales, tenemos 40 plantas de producción pública, el rol de la producción pública de vacunas y medicamentos también es una prioridad para nuestro país y estos esfuerzos nacionales y las iniciativas internacionales como el acelerador ACT, el llamamiento a la acción solidaria, el CITAP, el mecanismo COVAX, son mecanismos concretos pero no son suficientes. Hoy 130 países donde viven más de 2.500 millones de personas, todavía no han recibido vacunas y quizás no la reciban durante 2021. Y saber que nuestro país, nuestra región, cuenta con capacidades necesarias para poder ampliar esta producción, disminuir las brechas en el acceso, no solo de las vacunas, sino como decíamos, de otros insumos. Saber y recordar que la pandemia tuvo en nuestra región consecuencias realmente devastadoras, amenazado y realmente amenaza con retroceder en muchos logros económicos y sociales que hemos alcanzado, pero esto no puede representar más que una gran oportunidad para redoblar los esfuerzos, para avanzar hacia sociedades más equitativas, más inclusivas, más justas y que garanticen el efectivo derecho del de la población a la salud con equidad y con calidad en todos los países. Así que acá estamos con esta oportunidad, con esta responsabilidad de reconstruir esta recuperación que va a permitir fortalecer nuestra integración regional, nuestra producción local y eh, con esta posición que realmente es única para liderar este proceso, en, este, en esta cumbre, en esta reunión, en este nuevo encuentro que estamos cerca desde lejos con este objetivo y con eh, las, los compromisos y el esfuerzo que vamos a realizar para lograrlo. Muchas gracias. Good morning. I'd like to speak at this uh, meeting of Progressive International on the issue of manufacturing availability of vaccines against COVID-19 
in the third world is a very serious issue. First, we have seen ever since uh, this pandemic hit us that most of us in the third world have depended essentially and to a large extent on donations of vaccine from the Western countries. We in Kenya, for example, relied very much on COVAX and the World Health Organization to access vaccines, particularly AstraZeneca for the first batch of vaccination that we had in Kenya. What has happened so far is that we have not even been capable in the first round to vaccinate even 25% of those who need to be vaccinated in Kenya. Uh, we need to have two vac vaccinations to be complete. And I know with the importation of Johnson & Johnson again on a donation basis, we'll now be able to vaccinate many more people. But in the final analysis, it's much better to depend on your own resources for vaccination than be dependent on outside support. Now we know for certain that in a place like Kenya or many African countries, we have enough scientists with the good knowledge of genetic engineering, biotechnology, and all those sciences that are related to the manufacture of vaccines. What they lack actually is the technology. So the issue of sharing knowledge and technology transfer to developing countries in manufacturing vaccines is extremely important. Secondly, I don't think it's a question of money, because in the final analysis, we do have money that we can invest in infrastructure in billions and billions of dollars. And quite often we borrow money to do this and we pay a lot of money in interest to build our infrastructure. What about the health of our people? When it comes to the health of our people, that to me is a fundamental issue. And if we can find a way of working together across the third world, across developing countries, to develop the capacity and capability of manufacturing vaccines to deal with pandemic like COVID-19. And we may have many more pandemic in the future. We don't know how frequently they will come. We have been forewarned by this pandemic of COVID-19. We should therefore be prepared to deal with such pandemic in the future by developing the capacity and capability of manufacturing our own vaccines. We are grateful to hear, and we are really happy to hear that Cuba and Mexico have already done this, and indeed, there are vaccines on trial, and they are ready to collaborate with other third world countries in, in having access to the vaccines manufactured in Cuba and Mexico. This is a trend that should, should really be encouraged and, and, and developed. And therefore, I hope at this meeting, we shall have our colleagues and comrades from Mexico and, uh, and, and, and Cuba to, to share ideas and come out with some strong recommendations to the third world and to developing countries on this. I'm quite sure that the African Union has already taken an initiative to support the development of manufacturing vaccines in Africa. With that kind of initiative and the support of the Progressive International, I'm quite sure that we are going to be in a position to lay a basis, a positive basis supported by our own people and looking for resources, both at the knowledge level and technological level, to begin manufacturing vaccines in our own countries. Thank you very much. Estimadas compañeras y compañeros, la pandemia de la COVID-19 continúa representando un gran desafío para la salud pública y los gobiernos, con graves impactos en lo económico y social, revelando estadísticas mundiales muy críticas. Según datos oficiales de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, al cierre del 30 de mayo, 190 países y 30 territorios reportaban casos positivos y el número de personas contagiadas era mayor a los 170 millones con una letalidad de 2,08%. 
Cuba, con un promedio de mil casos diarios, tiene hoy una letalidad de 0,67% y las personas recuperadas representan el 95%. El abordaje de esta situación epidemiológica en nuestro país tiene como premisa la voluntad política y la gestión permanente del partido y el gobierno, la intersectorialidad con acciones concretas para disminuir los daños de la pandemia, la sostenibilidad y la participación activa de todo nuestro pueblo, organizaciones juveniles, estudiantiles, de masas y sociales, que ha tenido un papel decisivo en la lucha contra la enfermedad. El desempeño de la ciencia, con el desarrollo de investigaciones clínicas, la innovación y el trabajo conjunto con la industria biotecnológica y farmacéutica cubana, ha sido una fortaleza para el sistema de salud cubano, con el aporte de nuevos productos y conocimientos al combate de este virus. Actualmente, para la COVID-19, se encuentran registradas y puestas en marcha más de mil investigaciones, entre ellas el desarrollo de ensayos clínicos de cinco candidatos vacunales cubanos, dos de los cuales se encuentran en fase 3 de estudio. En este contexto, nuestro país realiza una intervención sanitaria en grupos y territorios de riesgo con dos candidatos vacunales, Soberano 02 y Agdala, que permitirá al cierre del mes de agosto tener vacunada al 70% de la población cubana. Y a partir del autorizo del uso de emergencia de las vacunas, lograremos tener inmunizada a toda nuestra población y apoyar a otros países que lo soliciten. Estamos en disposición que nuestros científicos y expertos apoyen en todos los esfuerzos para mitigar las consecuencias de la pandemia. Cuba se suma al llamado a eliminar los obstáculos que dificulten el acceso y la distribución de las vacunas, incluyendo cualquier medida coercitiva unilateral que impida, limite o encarezca el acceso a las mismas. Cuba reafirma la necesidad de trabajar para lograr la pronta inmunización universal, así como asegurar una distribución equitativa, solidaria y a precios asequibles. Estimados invitados, a pesar de la injusta campaña para desacreditar la cooperación médica internacional, Cuba respondió a las solicitudes de los gobiernos de contribuir al enfrentamiento de la pandemia de la COVID-19. De esta forma, 57 brigadas del contingente internacional de médicos especializados en desastres y graves epidemias, Henry V, con más de 4.000 colaboradores, han ofrecido sus servicios en 40 países. Hemos determinado continuar esta cooperación sanitaria internacional por ser afín con la naturaleza humanista del proyecto político, económico y social que defendemos. Cooperar con otros pueblos es un principio de la revolución cubana, inculcado por nuestro líder histórico, el comandante en jefe, Fidel Castro Ruz. En presencia de esta crisis por la pandemia, Cuba continúa sometida al brutal bloqueo impuesto por los Estados Unidos, que no solo se ha mantenido en vigor, sino que también se ha recrudecido con las 243 medidas implementadas por Trump que se mantienen vigentes por la administración de Biden, violando los derechos de los ciudadanos cubanos e impactando negativamente en los servicios de salud, no permitiendo el acceso a la tecnología avanzada, medicamentos, insumos y equipos médicos. Se impone con más razón que nunca que se exija el levantamiento del bloqueo de los Estados Unidos contra Cuba. Estamos seguros que el próximo 23 de junio, por vigésima novena ocasión, la comunidad internacional en la Asamblea General de las Naciones Unidas votará a favor de la resolución. Necesidad de poner fin al bloqueo económico, comercial y financiero impuesto por los Estados Unidos de América contra Cuba. Compañeras y compañeros, es lamentable que personas de todo el planeta sigan muriendo, que familias se sigan perdiendo a causa de la pandemia de la COVID-19. Se trata de unirnos, crear alianzas, intercambios internacionales, aprovechar los conocimientos especializados para encontrar la solución mundial contra esta enfermedad, con acceso a las pruebas diagnósticas, los tratamientos y las vacunas de todo el mundo. Quisiera expresar además que todos los logros alcanzados en esta etapa difícil en Cuba han sido posibles gracias al socialismo, a la revolución cubana y a nuestro noble y heroico pueblo. Muchas gracias.
Hello, my name is Nikki Ashton. I'm the Member of Parliament for Churchill Kiwetnokaski in Canada. I'm joining you from Treaty 5 territory, the traditional territory of the Nisichewasik Cree Nation, from my home community of Thompson in Northern Manitoba in Canada. Today, I stand in solidarity with leaders from across the global South and from around the world in making a clear call for urgent global access to COVID-19 vaccines and vaccine production. Over a year ago, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. This past year, we've seen clearly how neoliberalism has failed us around the world. The neoliberal agenda has proven not only dangerous, but deadly for millions of people around the world. People are being killed by neglect, clear, calculated neglect. Millions of people have paid for this crisis with their lives. Here in Canada, our elderly, Indigenous communities and workers have paid for this crisis with their lives. Indigenous communities in Canada, the most vulnerable communities to COVID-19, have been hit hard. Here in my province, almost 70% of our COVID cases have been among Indigenous people, even though only 30% of the population is Indigenous. Working people, particularly essential workers, many of them racialized, many of them immigrant, have also been disproportionately impacted. From workers in long-term care homes, to meat packing plants, to warehouses, to taxi drivers, they've been forced by employers, corporations, and governments to continue working without the safety and supports they deserved. We must be clear that our governments here, as elsewhere, have made conscious decisions to place corporate profits ahead of the well-being of people. And this has been evident in terms of our vaccine production. Our COVID vaccine rollout here in Canada has been marred by delays, cancellations and interruptions. It didn't have to be this way. We used to have publicly owned capacity. We used to have Connaught Labs. They engaged in groundbreaking work in developing vaccines and other medical treatments over seven decades. They produced vaccines for domestic consumption and for the world. In fact, in the 1960s, the WHO reached out to Connaught Labs for help in producing the smallpox vaccine. This work engaged numerous countries in Latin America. But in the 1980s, our conservative government privatized the labs and the liberal government that came after didn't bring it back. At that time and to this day, Canada continues to place the interest of big pharmaceutical corporations ahead of the well-being of people. It's time for a wake-up call. It's time for a transformative vision of our world economic system, one that prioritizes life instead of corporate greed and profit. Canada must stop prioritizing the profits of big pharma on the world stage and here at home. We must get off the fence and support the intellectual property waivers necessary and Canada must support countries like Bolivia and others seeking to manufacture vaccines here. Just last month, the government in Bolivia reached an agreement with the Canada-based drug manufacturer, BioLease, to acquire desperately needed vaccines for its citizens. But Trudeau's government refused to grant the compulsory license that would enable the company to produce the vaccines. This is unacceptable and shameful on Canada's part. As the people's vaccine movement has made clear, the G7 leaders' promises to vaccinate the world are pointless if they continue to fail to support the waiving of intellectual property and sharing of technology which would allow more vaccines, diagnostics and treatments to be made. The G7 has also been using Cold War rhetoric to attack China and block them and others in their work to produce life-saving vaccines. But change is coming. The Global South is challenging the economic status quo. The summit is bringing together inspiring, leading voices from the Global South, voices representing governments, movements, peoples who are taking bold steps to keep people safe. And this includes calling out the Global North for its obstructionism. From Bolivia to Chile to Argentina, left governments are putting forward a bold alternative vision for our world. From Kerala to Kenya, groundbreaking work is being shared about what is being done to keep people alive. From Cuba to Venezuela, anti-imperialist struggles are being shared with the world against the inhumane blockade and devastating sanctions. 
movements around the world are rising up and pushing back against corporate greed, right-wing authoritarianism, and rising fascism that has rendered us all vulnerable. Here in Canada, many are clear that we can no longer accept the status quo of privatization and austerity. We need publicly owned and publicly driven ways of producing what we need to keep people alive, including vaccines. Many are calling for a bold, transformative vision for a world coming out of this crisis, one rooted in decolonization, in working class solidarity and climate justice. This summit is a historic opportunity, a flashpoint in the effort to build global solidarity. Through this, we are presenting a shared vision for our world, a vision rooted in humanity and hope. Today, we call out the colonizing and imperialist agendas of governments in the global north that continue to exploit and oppress. Today, we call out corporations and profiteers who are exploiting people for profit. Today, we call on people from around the world to join us, to join movements calling for transformative change, for vaccine justice, for racial, social, environmental, and economic justice. Today, we make it clear that another world is possible and on its way. Let's keep going. Our world and our future depend on it. Thank you. Distinguished guests, leaders, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the Progressive International for your kind invitation. This is really a great honor for me to attend and share my talk in this very significant conference. I would like to extend my warmest greeting to all distinguished leaders, guests and friends. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is seen as the most dreadful disaster since World War II, with more than 170 million infected cases and about 3.74 million deaths recorded so far. The pandemic has not only affected regional and global landscape, but also revealed a variety of problems that our world is confronted to. Vietnam has been hit by four outbreaks since the virus was defeated, detected in late 2019, with a total number of more than 9,000 cases and 55 deaths. In the last outbreak, which started on the 27th of April 2021, more than 6,000 new cases have been recorded. Since the very early days of the pandemic, Vietnam has spent no effort to combat it. A variety of solutions have been implemented thanks to the strong determination of the government, timely and effective response of all other stakeholders, international support, and most important, the wholehearted support of the people. Vietnam has managed to limit the number of infected cases. It is nearly two years since the pandemic broke out in 2019, and vaccination has dominated the headline this day. The rollout of COVID-19 vaccine is becoming critical to protecting people's lives and stimulating economic recovery. But people are speaking about vaccine inequality throughout the world. Why developed countries are now moving ahead in the fight against the pandemic with high vaccination rates, developing countries are facing difficulty. For Vietnam, vaccination commenced on March 2021 with a total of more than 1.34 million people vaccinated, about 1.3% of the population. So far, the Ministry of Health has approved AstraZeneca, Sputnik V and Sinopharm for use in emergency. The country is also working on producing its own vaccine by the end of the third quarter this year. It has also launched a COVID-19 vaccine fund worth 40 million USD 
with contribution from businesses, NGO, and individual. However, Vietnam's functioning nation is now facing challenges to increase from very small rates at present to 70 to 75 percent in a short time. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I really appreciate Progressive International's initiative to organize a workshop on vaccine internationalism. Vietnam, in its past struggle for national independence and the current cost for national construction, has benefited from internationalism. Internationalism, according to our respected leaders Ho Chi Minh, was too directional. It sought to mobilize international support and to contribute to the struggle for peace, independence, democracy, and social progress over the world. In this context, progressive international should play the role of a main progressive force to uphold the spirit of internationalism, international solidarity, and cooperation. The role and mission of such movement as progressive internationalism have become more and more critical than ever. All would depend on our action. I am confident that with the spirit of internationalism, together we will defeat the COVID-19 pandemic and advance toward achieving a world of peace, development, equality and progress. Thank you very much. El año 2020 para Bolivia fue particular. El 2019, en noviembre, se interrumpió el orden constitucional con un golpe de Estado y el gobierno del golpe no se preocupó demasiado por la, por la pandemia, más bien la utilizó para tratar de consolidarse y perpetuarse en el poder. Eh, logramos recuperar la democracia para noviembre, eh, se instaló un nuevo gobierno a la cabeza del presidente Luis Arce y desde entonces empezamos a luchar contra la pandemia. Pero llegamos tarde esta, a esta lucha por vacunas, por medicamentos. Eh, en ese entonces Bolivia no tenía la provisión eh, ni, de, ni de medicamentos y no estaba en ninguna de las listas para contar con vacunas. Y con mucho esfuerzo y gracias a, a buenas relaciones bilaterales con algunos países amigos, eh, logramos provisiones de medicamentos y para fines de diciembre del 2020 eh, suscribimos un primer contrato para contar con más de 5 millones de dosis de las vacunas Sputnik B. Fuimos avanzando para febrero, contratamos uh, otra cantidad similar uh, para contar con vacunas AstraZeneca. Y eh, en, eh, paralelamente habíamos estado trabajando con el mecanismo COVAX y también teníamos el compromiso de contar con varios millones de vacunas por ese mecanismo. Para fines de febrero, de alguna forma, respirábamos con cierta tranquilidad pero esa tranquilidad nos duró poco, porque eh, lo que de alguna manera era previsible empezó a ocurrir, una escasez mundial de vacunas. Eh, algunos países habían acaparado las vacunas, eh, estábamos eh, viendo cómo inclusive en lugares como la Unión Europea escaseaban, ¿no? y esos contratos, esos acuerdos que teníamos firmados, eh, empezaron a cumplirse. ¿no? Eh, nuestra provisión de Sputnik B se demoró, era una demanda de su propio país que primero se ocupe de, de, de su población. En el caso de las AstraZeneca, de las vacunas de AstraZeneca, eh, la India eh, tuvo una crisis por la pandemia y cerraron la posibilidad de exportación. 
Eh, el mecanismo COVAX había apostado mucho para, para proveer de vacunas a Latinoamérica con mm, las farmacéuticas, con las empresas in, indias, ¿no? entre ellas el Instituto Serum, que estaba produciendo AstraZeneca. Nos llegaron 228 mil iniciales y luego la incertidumbre total. De, 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 de tener de alguna manera asegurado contractualmente con documentos provisión de vacunas, eh, llegamos a un punto en el que eh, eh, la situación era incierta. Como, como país, eh, desplegamos tres líneas de acción estratégica. Por un lado, insistimos con nuestros proveedores para que pudieran cumplir los compromisos que habían asumido y hemos estado teniendo algún éxito. Seguimos recibiendo provisiones de la Sputnik B, no en las cantidades que se tenían comprometidas, en los tiempos que se tenían comprometidos. En el caso del Instituto Serum, ya no nos llega más AstraZeneca. Eh, en el caso de, de, de COVAX, nos han estado llegando algunas vacunas más de, de, de Pfizer. Esa es una línea estratégica que seguimos. Una segunda línea fue la de ver nuevos proveedores por diferentes medios, ya sea o mecanismos ¿no? de relación bilateral o de contratos comerciales. ¿no? Y en ese ámbito logramos uh, importantes avances, y logramos provisión de vacunas de la, de, de la empresa Sinopharm de China, que nos han estado ayudando significativamente. Eh, y eh, empezamos a buscar en el mercado otras posibilidades de también contar con, con vacunas. Eh, pero es evidente, eh, todavía en el mundo existe una carencia de las vacunas necesarias. Finalmente, tenemos una tercera línea de acción estratégica que eh, nosotros consideramos es estructural, porque la, el, en el proceso de reflexión que, te, que, que, que nos ha llevado la búsqueda, a, que nos, a la que nos ha llevado la búsqueda de, de las vacunas, eh, advertimos que en el mundo no existe por el momento, la suficiente capacidad productiva como para abastecer a todos los que necesitan vacunas en el tiempo prudente. Según dicen los expertos, necesitamos inmunizar por lo menos al 70% de la población mundial para salir de la pandemia. Y eso se hace difícil cuando solo se producen por determinadas empresas, ¿ya? Eh, porque tienen las patentes. Y hay otras empresas que, públicas, privadas, que pueden producirlas, pero que no pueden hacerlas porque no tienen las licencias. Entonces, en nuestra tercera línea de acción estratégica como Bolivia, nosotros hemos propuesto y estamos defendiendo en todos los escenarios que se deben liberar las patentes de las vacunas y realizar la transferencia de, te de la tecnología que sea necesaria para que se pueda multiplicar la capacidad productiva de las vacunas. En esa misma línea, también hemos activado ya, el mecanismo para lograr una licencia obligatoria en el marco de las reglas del juego que establece la OMC. En nuestra primera línea estratégica, no, trabajamos junto a Sudáfrica, junto a la India ya para fines del año 2020 inclusive, y en este 2020 hemos estado llevando nuestra voz a todos los foros que nos ha sido posible. Y, y creemos que se está construyendo un, una, una conciencia colectiva global de que ese es el camino. Pero todavía no se ha logrado resultados concretos. Porque si bien hay una gran mayoría de países, entre ellos fundamentalmente de países en desarrollo que ven en esta una opción, en la OMC no se ha cambiado ni una letra. Y minuto que pasa, más vidas se exponen. Las sociedades sufren o sufrimos una crisis que ahorita ya es multidimensional. El escenario hacia el futuro 
todavía es complejo y gris. Desde Bolivia tenemos nuestras herramientas y nuestros instrumentos para poder enfrentar la pandemia. Creemos que vamos a lograrlo en este escenario, pero ahí no se acaba el compromiso, porque la pandemia es algo que afecta a la humanidad misma. Y entonces la solución la tenemos que encontrar como humanidad. Y esto, en este momento, nos está planteando el reto de que cambiemos las reglas del juego, de que cambiemos las reglas de la OMC. No puede ser posible que en una crisis sanitaria mundial todavía se esté privilegiando el beneficio de las empresas farmacéuticas. Y no se trata de que querramos escamotearle su ganancia. Estamos dispuestos a pagar de reconocerles una ganancia equitativa, justa, ¿ya? pero que exista la provisión necesaria en un plazo prudente. Ese es el reto con el que nos enfrentamos hoy día. Si somos capaces, a esta hora de la historia, ¿ya? de consolidar la prevalencia de la vida humana como derecho humano frente a al privilegio mercantil y la ganancia, o por el contrario, digamos, eh, simple y llanamente nos resignamos ¿ya? a que se salve quien pueda, ¿ya? mientras algunas empresas farmacéuticas eh, cuentan ganancias de millones de dólares cada día. Brothers and sisters, it has been a year and a half since mankind's battle with the novel coronavirus began. Over the last 18 months, COVID-19 has transformed into a global pandemic. However, a global action plan to end it has not been evolved yet. This pandemic has further increased the inequality between the haves and have-nots. If you take the Indian example, the rich few off to safer destinations in private jets, while the poor struggled for hospital beds and life-saving oxygen support. We are probably witnessing the biggest transfer of wealth in human history, with daily wage laborers losing their livelihoods and international finance capital further strengthening itself and the solidarity between drug manufacturers and intellectual property rights advocates are further widening the inequalities around us. Therefore, conferences such as this are the need of the hour. The axiom that no one is safe until everyone is safe should guide us. Vaccines can keep us safe health-wise. At the same time, an action plan is required at the global level for economies too. Global solidarity is essential to ensure health and relief. Accountability is also imperative to ensure equality. That is where forums like Progressive International can play a lead role. Essentially, the COVID pandemic manifests as a tug of war between lives and livelihoods. Both ends have to be catered to so that neither 
and falls. Stability is imperative in this battle. Let me share some of our experience in Kerala, a small coastal state in the southern tip of India. As far as governments go, they have the responsibility of protecting both the lives and livelihoods of the people. It is in fact that fundamental duty in a democracy, the left democratic front government in Kerala was sure of its responsibility right from day one, which is why we were the first in the country to declare a lockdown so that people's lives can be protected as well as to announce a COVID relief special economic package to the tune of US dollars 2.72 billion so that their livelihoods could be saved. Over the last four years before COVID struck, the LDF government had strengthened Kerala's robust public health system. Through the Ardram mission, we had ensured super speciality services even in district and talu hospitals. Primary health centers had been upgraded into family health centers. Through the Kerala Infrastructure Investment Fund Board, we have provided an infusion of US dollars 218 million to prove the healthcare infrastructure in the state. More than 5,200 additional ports were created in our public health system. An Institute of Advanced Virology and a Medical Technology Consortium were set up through the Life Sciences Park studies in biotechnology and medical research were strengthened. Public sector enterprises like Kerala State Drugs and Pharmaceuticals were improved to produce and export medicines. By supplementing the inherent strength of our public health system, we were able to prepare it to combat viruses like Nipah and novel corona. We took up special measures to care for the daily wage laborers and the marginalized and disadvantaged communities. Realizing that all sections of the society would face difficulties, the government provided kits containing essential articles to all with the motto, none shall starve. Unlike many other parts, Kerala retained and strengthened its public distribution system. And it was of immense help in the pandemic situation. Meals were provided through the community kitchens and people's hotels. We took care of our guest workers. It is a matter of great pride for us. We took up social welfare measures lest the economy should come to a grinding halt. Thus, Kerala was able to contain the downslide of the economy at minus 3.82% when it was minus 7.3% at the All India level in 2020-21. The economic interventions ensured that our circumstances would be conducive for proceeding steadily in the fight against the disease. It also strengthened our preventive measures by encouraging the people to adhere to lockdown protocols as their material needs were met even while they stayed put at home. This was a novel intervention by Kerala. At the same time, to strengthen our COVID core, we created temporary ports through the National Health Mission. COVID first line treatment centers were set up at local government levels. We enrolled the help of volunteers and voluntary organizations, staying true to our commitment to decentralization and strengthening of local bodies. Ward level committees were formed to help 
in monitoring and managing the pandemic. Public sector enterprises were directed to produce masks, sanitizers, and life-saving drugs. The experiences of doctors and scientists were apt to find solutions arising out of the health emergency. Even before the lockdown was announced, video conferences were held with traders to ensure adequate stock and to manage the supply chain. All these helped us in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic in its first wave. As far as vaccines are concerned, we have an unfortunate situation arising wherein producers are dictating prices despite getting governmental assistance in the development and manufacturing of vaccines. The fact that in some cases various state governments have to pit themselves against one another to order to get adequate supply and at reasonable rates is also a matter of grave concern. Vaccines going to the highest bidder means that universal and free availability remains simply a dream. And without free and universal vaccination, herd immunity against the pandemic will elude us. At a time when vaccine manufacturing companies are trying to seek financial gains by exploiting the scarcity in supply, federal governments should step in. Necessary steps should be taken to ensure that intellectual property rights and patent laws and conventions do not stand in the way of manufacturing COVID-19 vaccine, which should have the status of a public good from which no one shall be excluded. Options like compulsory licensing should be explored and public sector pharmaceutical companies which are capable of producing vaccines should be immediately mobilized into action. Despite the limitations that state governments have in India's federal policy, Kerala took the lead in announcing free and universal vaccination in India. Accordingly, we earmarked US dollars 136 million for providing vaccine to all above 18 years of age and US dollars 136 million for purchasing allied equipments. We have promised to ensure first dose of vaccine to all those above the age of 40 by 15th July and included those with mental disabilities in the priority group. Additionally, to support vaccine production in Kerala, on a long-term basis, a vaccine research unit is being commenced at the Institute of Advanced Virology. In the beginning, I had said that it is the fundamental duty of governments in a democracy to safeguard the lives and livelihoods of the, its people. However, in our present global scenario, it seems that only those who think in terms of alternatives are committed to even ensuring those basic rights of the people. To me, this conference is a result of alternative thinking. For the sake of humanity, we have to take up the moral responsibility on us to see that health services and vaccines are made available to all across the globe, building adequate health facilities, restoring supply chains, ensuring cold storage, and above all, making knowledge free and accessible are essential if we are to ensure that everyone is safe. To that end, I wish this conference the very best and conclude by extending solidarity in the call to end this pandemic. Greetings to you all.
Thank you for inviting me to this vital summit today. And thank you to the Progressive International for all the work you do to organize, mobilize, and unite progressive forces all around the world. We're at a critical moment. The rollout of coronavirus vaccines around the world has provided a vital light at the end of the tunnel, giving us a chance to escape this crisis. But no one is safe until everyone is safe. In the UK, where I am, many of us have now had two doses of vaccines already. But in the world's poorest countries, people are currently having to wait until as late as the end of 2023. While some rich countries have acquired enough doses to vaccinate their entire population three times over, experts suggest that nine out of 10 people in the poorest countries will not receive a vaccine this year. There are some of the countries least equipped to handle a major health crisis, often due to the legacy of colonialism, the exploitation of people's labor through global markets, IMF enforced austerity programs, and other forms of deliberately entrenched inequality. It's also about our own safety. The longer this situation continues, the greater the risk of vaccine resistant variants emerging and dragging the entire world backwards. Like any forms of narrow nationalism and resource hoarding, vaccine nationalism hurts all of us everywhere, apart from the profit margins of the wealthiest few. Nine big pharma executives and owners have become billionaires through the pandemic, while the rest of us suffer. Not only are richer countries hoarding vaccines, they're preventing poorer countries from producing their own. The US now supports a waiver, albeit limited, of intellectual property law to allow all countries to produce vaccines. But the UK, the European Union and other global North countries continue to block it, putting big pharma mega profits before global public health and economic well-being. This is why events like today are so important. The global elite will not fix this problem for us. We cannot wait for good sense to prevail in the boardrooms and government offices of the most powerful. We have to provide solutions ourselves. That's why I'm so inspired to be with you today, to see the governments from the global south come together to find collective solutions to end the pandemic. Socialists and progressives in the UK stand with you. We salute your efforts and pledge to grow solidarity across borders, put pressure on our governments to change course and challenge a rigged trade system that routinely prevents vital medicines getting to those who need them most. This pandemic has compounded an already existing global crisis of inequality. It's been worsened by the nationalism and short-sightedness, by decisions to cut and privatize health services, by political choices to tolerate horrific social and health inequalities within and between nations, and by putting the needs of the profiteers before our right to health and life. The first and most important lesson we have to take from this crisis in an age of climate chaos, a new wave of lower power struggles and wealth concentrating even further at the top is the urgency of our task, coming together to build a world that works for the many, not the few. Seeing this summit come together today and being here with you makes me more certain that we can and we will succeed. Thank you so much for being here today. COVID-19 pandemic has really exposed the inability of governments to come together, and it has brought out the flaws of policy thinking that are relying on pure nationalism and on foolish ideas of protecting the profits of a few companies vis-a-vis -vis lives and people. 
We have the technology, we have the knowledge that will enable us to rid ourselves of this pandemic. We have the means, we have the distribution capacities, we have everything that is required except for the political will. And that's absolutely important. There are so few things that need to be done in this. First of all, we have to waive the intellectual property rights, certainly for the vaccines, but also for all of the, the uh, testing and treatment and other things associated with the pandemic. We need to ensure that the companies that have the knowledge for vaccine making, and that includes companies that have benefited from public research and public funding, very significant public funding, that these companies share that knowledge with other producers across the world, including in the developing world, that are willing to make this, these vaccines quickly. And we need to ensure the distribution is rapid, and with adequate resources to ensure that there is no wastage or minimal wastage of the vials. And finally, we have to make sure that no individual has to pay for a vaccine. This must be the responsibility of states and those states who cannot afford it have to be funded by other governments. We have the institutional means, we have the mechanisms, we have everything that is required. We simply have to put our heads together and make sure that this happens. Because unless we do this, the world will not be rid of this pandemic. But also, the world will show that it is incapable of dealing with much more serious existential threats that are already upon us, like climate change. So it is imperative that we resolve the problems of vaccine supply and distribution at the earliest possible time and in a most urgent way. The COVID-19 pandemic placed Palestinians in Palestine with the formidable challenge of dealing with a deadly virus under settler colonial occupation. Among many things, this regime of absolute control has had a direct and detrimental effect, not only on Palestinians' access to healthcare, but also on the quality of care on offer, particularly in the West Bank and Gaza. Israel's military occupation has left the Palestinian healthcare system undersupplied and with insufficient medical facilities. For decades, rather than being allowed to develop self-sufficiency, Palestinians living in these occupied territories have been forced to rely on outside help to meet their even most basic healthcare needs. When COVID-19 hit, the Palestinian authorities were in no shape to implement effective pandemic mitigation strategies or procure the necessary medications and enough vaccines to protect Palestinians. Indeed, the Palestinian authorities have struggled to procure the vaccine. And whilst the vaccine rollout is happening in Palestine, it's happening slowly. Meanwhile, the Israeli regime has vaccinated the majority of its citizens and was even hailed the global champion of the vaccination rollout. Yet this narrative distracted from the fact that the Israeli regime was and is still deliberately avoiding its responsibility to provide the vaccine for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Article 56 of the Fourth Geneva Convention specifically provides that an occupier has the duty of ensuring the adoption and application of the prophylactic and preventative measures necessary to combat the spread of contagious diseases and epidemics. In other words, the Israeli regime has a legal obligation to procure a sufficient amount of COVID-19 vaccines for Palestinians living under its military occupation. But it hasn't. Rather, it's consistently failed to meet its legal and moral obligations. This treatment of Palestinians exemplifies the relationship between the settler and the indigenous population, whereby the former's life is prioritised over the latter. The systematization of this prioritization over many decades has rendered Palestinians vulnerable and more susceptible to the virus. And even now, as some Palestinians are getting vaccinated, we are seeing systematic global discrimination where Palestinians are forbidden from entering countries, even if they are vaccinated, because Palestine is not on a green list. 
This is, of course, not only the case for Palestinians, but for whole groups of peoples around the world, which really highlights the fact that this pandemic, despite what the celebrities were saying early on, is not serving as a great equaliser. Rather, it's shining a spotlight on structures of power and oppression that privilege the health of some over others. Palestinians, like other oppressed, colonised and vulnerable communities in the world, should not have their right to the vaccine forsaken because of a politics which favours some lives over others. Access to the vaccine and treatment for the virus should be available to all. Desde Venezuela agradecemos a la Internacional Progresista por esta iniciativa y la oportunidad de que podamos aportar a este debate tan importante. Consideramos que el COVID-19 dejó en evidencia, dejó desnudo al sistema capitalista, al modelo que se impuso y es responsabilidad de quienes tenemos pensamientos afines el poder construir ese mundo que no es solo posible, por supuesto que es posible, sino que es indispensable, porque ni la madre tierra ni la humanidad podrán soportar mucho tiempo más este sistema que quedó desnudo, como le decíamos. Es de gran importancia el cómo la crueldad y la desigualdad del sistema quedan a la luz, cómo aquellos países, aquellas sociedades que sufrieron fenómenos de disminución a su mínima expresión del Estado-Nación, quedaron también vulneradas y vulnerables ante el COVID-19. Por eso la importancia de fortalecer lo público, de fortalecer los estados y su capacidad de protección de los pueblos. En Venezuela hemos construido a lo largo de los últimos 22 años un sistema de protección social amplio, expandido y además con un componente fundamental que es el protagonismo del pueblo. Ese sistema de protección social, bueno, se vio sometido a una prueba de fuego con el coronavirus, sobre todo en el ámbito de la salud, desde los consultorios populares en los barrios, con la misión Barrio Adentro, que fue creada con Cuba hace ya casi 19 años, hasta, por supuesto, los centros diagnósticos intermedios, las clínicas populares y los grandes hospitales. Un sistema, una red integral pública que, hemos de decir, funcionó, aprobó la prueba. Afortunadamente, en Venezuela, el 98% de los casos de coronavirus que se han presentado han sido atendidos en el sector público. Hemos coordinado bien con el sector privado. Y de ese total, el 92% de los casos se ha recuperado. Para el día de ayer, 2 de junio, en Venezuela se habían presentado 236.755 casos y lamentablemente 2.674 personas han fallecido por la COVID-19. Pero ¿cuántos fallecen en Brasil a diario? ¿Cuántos fallecen en Colombia, en Perú? Es decir, Venezuela dentro de la complejidad y la agresión ha logrado contener lo peor de la pandemia del coronavirus. En nuestro país, el presidente Nicolás Maduro ha instruido que los tratamientos sean gratuitos para todos y para todas. Que las vacunas, por supuesto, son gratuitas y de libre acceso en la medida en que van llegando al país así como las pruebas diagnóstico y cualquier insumo que se necesite. Tenemos un método del 7 por 7, cuarentenas, confinamientos de 7 días, una semana y flexibilización la semana siguiente, que se va evaluando. En ocasiones se decretan dos semanas de cuarentena y poco a poco hemos ido logrando controlar la pandemia, cosa que no ha ocurrido en otros países de nuestra América del Sur. Y hacerlo 
en medio de la agresión, del bloqueo financiero, de las sanciones crueles, inhumanas, que nos han impedido adquirir los insumos necesarios, las vacunas, los, eh, las mascarillas incluso, los barbijos, ha sido un gran desafío para Venezuela. Para nuestro país salir al mercado es encontrarnos con precios exorbitantes, con fletes, con seguros que hacen casi inaccesible el poder satisfacer las necesidades sanitarias de nuestro pueblo. Y sin embargo, hemos avanzado en esa dirección, como también gracias a la solidaridad de Cuba, nuestra hermana Cuba, con sus médicos presentes, con sus candidatos vacunales, produciremos dos de las vacunas aquí en Venezuela. China, siempre un puente aéreo permanente, Rusia, Turquía, la propia Naciones Unidas, a través de la Organización Panamericana de la Salud y de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, en una escala menor, pero también han aportado. Gracias a esa solidaridad multipolar, hemos logrado que Venezuela pueda salir adelante con un control que podemos nosotros exponer ante el mundo. Pero pensemos qué hubiese ocurrido si no hubiésemos tenido los 5 mil, casi 6 mil millones de dólares bloqueados en la banca internacional por la agresión imperialista. ¿Qué hubiese ocurrido si la producción petrolera de Venezuela hubiese estado en óptimas condiciones, pero que gracias o por culpa de las sanciones se ha disminuido? Si pudiésemos vender libremente nuestra producción petrolera y de otros rubros en el mundo, no hubiese faltado absolutamente nada. Y es más, pudiésemos decir que con iniciativas como Petrocaribe, que ha sido herida, eh, está en terapia intensiva y la vamos a sacar de allí por las sanciones de Estados Unidos, no faltaría nada en el Caribe, no faltaría nada en nuestras naciones hermanas para poder atender la pandemia del coronavirus. Este es el momento, queridas hermanas, queridos hermanos, de que quienes pensamos de manera afín, insistimos, los progresistas, la izquierda mundial, las causas revolucionarias, las causas sociales, podamos ponernos de acuerdo en una agenda mínima y terminar de superar el modelo capitalista. Es hoy o ya no será. Es hoy o no lo habremos logrado. Y estamos seguros que tenemos la voluntad y que tenemos la razón y que podremos salir adelante con nuestros pueblos y construir un mundo mejor para siempre. Muchas gracias. Здравствуйте, уважаемые участники саммита. Текущая ситуация с вакцинацией COVID-19 в КР остается сложной. На сегодня количество вакцинированных составляет 88 тысяч человек. Из них полностью вакцинировано 44 тысячи человек. Это ничтожно мало для нашей страны. Кыргызстан полностью зависит в вопросах биобезопасности, так как у нас слабый потенциал в вопросах оценки потребностей и прогнозирования и пит ситуации, производства тестов и вакцин. Поэтому ситуация с ростом заболеваемости COVID-19 в Кыргызстане ухудшается. В стране используется вакцина китайского производства Синофарм, зарегистрированная Всемирной организацией здравоохранения. Данная вакцина поставляется в страну в рамках грантовой помощи. Также начато вакцинирование российской вакциной «Спутник-5», предоставленной в рамках гуманитарной помощи и закупаемой правительством страны и средств республиканского бюджета. Другим источником вакцин, мы надеемся, станет COVAX, тогда в страну поступят еще вакцины, зарегистрированные в ВОЗ. Страна заинтересована и выражает приверженность в развитии производства вакцин и тестов, понимая, что необходима консолидация усилий всех заинтересованных сторон. Одной из возможностей для развития производства может стать механизм государственно-частного производства вакцин и тестов. Другой возможностью является имеющийся кадровый потенциал общественного здравоохранения и научного сообщества, представителей вузовской и медицинской науки, заинтересованные в развитии производства вакцин и тестов. Данный механизм даст возможность привлечь бизнес и инвестиции в данное производство. 
Я желаю эффективной работы саммиту и успехов всем. Dear brothers and sisters, first of all, I want to congratulate the eminent personalities and progressive thinkers for organizing such an international summit on vaccine internationalism. We are all fighting with COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic taught us several lessons. There is a saying that the pandemic is a litmus test to the system governance throughout the world. Wherever the government invested more money into the public health system, there the fight against the pandemic is comparatively easy. And wherever they are not investing in public sector, it is too difficult. And the fight against the pandemic, the first facet is to get proper immunity. We want to get herd immunity throughout the world. Then only we can save human race from the cruel virus. To get herd immunity, the only method or the effective method is vaccination. And how to produce the vaccine and distribute the vaccine? That is the great question. Now, throughout the world, we can examine Especially in capitalist world, the vaccine also is becoming a profiteering business. That should not be allowed. We should have vaccine internationalism and we should ask to waive all the barriers, all the laws which prevent the easy movement of vaccine throughout the world. Our country, India, declared free vaccine to all Indian citizens. My state, Kerala, also declared free vaccination. But the intellectual property rights on vaccine production and the pharmaceutical companies definitely utilize it for profiteering and that should be controlled. India government uh, raised the propaganda to waive the intellectual property rights on vaccine and along with South Africa also sent some letters to the World Trade Organization to waive the TRIPS laws. Trade related intellectual property rights give some protection for the pharmaceutical companies to produce vaccine as their own and make it a profiteering business. But we have to raise slogan to waive the trips on vaccine production and to produce vaccine as a common good to human beings and to distribute throughout the world to save human race. That should be our slogan in future days. I hope that uh, United Nations and World Health Organization will take some measures to prompt the whole countries to have more vaccine productions as their own. They should get permission and they can distribute vaccine to the whole community and that way we can contain the virus. We should work without any barriers, any borders, all the human race and all the countries would have to unite to fight against the contagion. Thank you.
Pakistan began its uh, inclusion drive in February. As of June 12, only 1.3% of the country's entire population has been uh, vaccinated. At the snail's speed, progress becomes far more pronounced when one can see the great strides being made in the developed countries um, in finally overcoming uh, pandemic through mass vaccinations. In Pakistan, however, um, a great challenge for the state has been the procurement uh, and distribution of the vaccine. Pakistan has relied heavily on uh, internationalism uh, to gain access to the vaccines. Most um, shots being given to Pakistan, um, the public uh, healthcare centers were through um, donations under COVAX or were purchased from China at a uh, time of severe distress. The rich and the poor within Pakistan have experienced um, uh, this pandemic differently. Um, when infected, the rich are able to gain access to um, um, private and as well as uh, uh, public health care facilities um, where they can afford to pay heavy fees and heavy, um, um, heavy expenses of the private health care and where they can get beds, where they can get ventilators. While for the other part, the, the poorest, uh, it, it is not uh, the case. Uh, similarly, uh, vaccine rollout in Pakistan has been um, uh, experiencing, experiencing um, uh, the same kind of uh, difficulties. Like um, uh, for most of the poor, um, it, it it was it wasn't that much easy. Uh, while for the for the rich people, um, uh, they could have uh, you know uh, easily get it through the. Uh, through private uh, health care also. Um, Pakistan was one of the first countries in the world to allow private imports of COVID-19 vaccines um, in open market. Authorities expect richer Pakistanis to buy their own vaccination shots, uh, which they have been doing. Uh, most of public awareness campaigns uh, um, on the virus and the vaccine have been mostly on uh, social media. A very little effort has been uh, made to educate uh, um, and motivate communities um, at the grassroots, apart from some of the social movements, um, uh, including Hakuke Health Movement and other um, uh, friends who have been uh, doing it on ground. The result is that uh, many people, particularly in the working class or the poor communities, uh, do not understand this pandemic, and the same is the case. Uh, uh, with the with the vaccine, then um, uh, at this point there is a great vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy because of some of the um, uh, conspiracy theories, and, and that also mostly among the working class, and uh, it 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 is these communities uh, who desperately need uh, the vaccine uh, in order to um, uh, for the uh, inclusion drive to be very effective or um, uh, successful. Uh, much more can be done to overcome this pandemic and in my opinion uh, it comes down to simple principles. Um, we must honor the right uh, to life of every um, individual and by extension uh, the fundamental right to health. Uh, our two-pronged strategy of access and affordability must be adopted. Um, testing treatment and the vaccination drive should be accessible um, and affordable to every uh, member of the society. Uh, thank you very much.
Compañeros y compañeros de la Internacional Progresista, primero me presento, mi nombre es Giorgio Jackson, soy actualmente diputado al Congreso Nacional de Chile por el Frente Amplio, por el Partido Revolución Democrática. No soy yo quien venga a decirles que estamos viviendo momentos muy complejos en el mundo producto del COVID-19. Todos y todas acá presentes sabemos cómo las desigualdades inherentes al sistema capitalista global se han agudizado con esta pandemia y han salido a la luz. También sabemos cómo las muertes producto de esta enfermedad lamentablemente también están relacionadas a la falta de recursos de la población. Otra cosa que sabemos es que las familias trabajadoras se han empobrecido durante esta pandemia y que las familias multimillonarias se han enriquecido aún más. Pero eso no es todo. También sabemos que las y los mejores científicos de nuestra sociedad pudieron dar con soluciones que nos permitan mitigar en gran parte este problema sanitario a través de diversas vacunas contra el COVID-19. Sin embargo, la historia nos muestra cómo la industria farmacéutica multinacional ha preferido mantener su monopolio y sus ganancias desmedidas por sobre el interés y la vida de las personas frente a catástrofes sanitarias y que para superarlas se ha requerido de presión política por nuevos consensos sobre las normas de propiedad intelectual. Lo vimos en los 90 frente a la epidemia del VIH cuando la industria farmacéutica remetió contra el uso de las, de las licencias obligatorias de sus patentes sobre tratamientos antirretrovirales, causando la muerte de millones de personas que se pudo haber evitado. Solo gracias a la presión internacional liderada por países africanos y otros como Brasil e India, fue posible frenar las acciones de lobby farmacéutico en contra de aquellos países pobres en vías de desarrollo y permitir así el uso de las flexibilidades del ADPIC o TRIPS en inglés. Igualmente, en ese contexto, es que se logró en 2001 un consenso en la declaración de Doha para que quedara claro que los países son libres de determinar la justificación de las licencias obligatorias y normalizar su uso. Nuevamente, frente a una pandemia con efectos desgarradores a nivel global en materia social, económica y, por supuesto, sanitaria, a pesar de que no tienen capacidad las farmacéuticas de producir la cantidad y celeridad con la que ellos mismos se han comprometido en sus contratos de producción con los países y también en iniciativas como el COVAX de la OMS, ni tampoco, y menos aún, con las necesidades que el mundo tiene hoy día para poder controlar la expansión y mutación del virus alrededor del mundo, se han negado a compartir voluntariamente las fórmulas de las vacunas y tratamientos, como también se han negado a ampliar su capacidad de producción con nuevas plantas o u ocupando todas las ya existentes y disponibles a nivel mundial. Causa indignación que ninguna haya respondido al llamado de solidaridad hecho por el presidente de Costa Rica con la adhesión de 43 países en el marco de la OMS, que dio origen al COVID Technology Access Pool, que gestiona dicha organización y que pide a las farmacéuticas y centros de investigación licenciar y compartir voluntariamente el conocimiento para la producción de vacunas, tratamientos y otras tecnologías. Igualmente escandalizan las condiciones abusivas que han impuesto a los gobiernos y organizaciones que han contratado la provisión de dichas vacunas, preocupándose principalmente por sus ganancias sin importar mucho el cumplimiento de los tiempos y cantidades acordadas, menos aún de las personas que van a quedar al margen sin acceso a estas vacunas. Es ante esta situación que es nuevamente indispensable que la comunidad internacional adopte medidas urgentes, que pongan fin a esta escasez artificial creada por los monopolios de las patentes, porque impide ampliar la capacidad de producción y distribución de vacunas o tratamientos, lo que repercute en la dificultad de abordar la pandemia de, de forma global, oportuna y justa. Por eso es que hoy podemos actuar en múltiples niveles. Primero, construir sobre lo avanzado en la declaración de Doha, sobre propiedad intelectual y salud pública, garantizando la libertad de los países para adoptar en el contexto de la propiedad intelectual todo lo que sea necesario para asegurar el acceso a las tecnologías del COVID sin el riesgo jurídico de demandas por incumplimiento a las disposiciones de los ADPIC o TRIPS. En segundo lugar, construir nuevas formas de mandato sobre la inversión pública e incentivos a la industria que no impliquen la privatización del conocimiento y la dificultad de realizar la transferencia tecnológica que necesitamos en momentos como este. En tercer lugar, necesitamos unirnos como sur global para rediscutir los marcos jurídicos que hoy rigen el comercio y las relaciones internacionales, en las que domina la posición de los países más aventajados en el norte global, 
un buen inicio para esto debería ser un tratado sobre las pandemias. Me despido enviando un abrazo fraterno a ustedes y a través suyo a todas y todos los trabajadores de la salud en sus países que han sido fundamentales para mitigar parcialmente los efectos del COVID. Estoy convencido que la acción colectiva y la presión internacional puede llevarnos a muchos mejores resultados que los que nos ha llevado, lamentablemente, este sistema que se preocupa del individuo, que se preocupa del de, eh, lucro y no pone por encima eh, el derecho a la salud y al bienestar de la población. Un abrazo y nos estamos viendo. Hello, my name is Jean Ross, and I'm a president of National Nurses United, the largest union of registered nurses in the United States. It's an honor to join you for this important summit for vaccine internationalism. Nurses and healthcare workers around the world have witnessed firsthand the toll this horrific pandemic has taken. Here in the US, 600,000 of our patients, family, and community members have died of COVID-19. Almost 4,000 healthcare workers have lost their lives, including over 400 nurses and 23 members of our union. It didn't have to be this way, but our profit-driven healthcare system and decades of cuts and privatization of our public health and social welfare programs left us catastrophically unprepared for this pandemic. Capital continued to put profits before people during a once in a lifetime public health emergency. And our employers and government failed to give nurses the protection we needed to stay safe. The Biden administration has taken important steps to expand vaccination in the US, end our economic crisis and improve workplace protections for healthcare workers. But there is more to be done. We need stronger COVID-19 safety measures for all workers in communities. And we cannot act as if the pandemic were over, as the U US Centers for Disease Control did when it recently relaxed masking and other public health guidelines. Nurses know that this pandemic is not over. pandemic has been a, a tragic event for the whole world, of course, and was probably the biggest crisis in the world since the Second World War, at least. It was clear for everyone that vaccination was needed. We were too slow. Brazil was too slow. Brazil has an excellent vaccination system, one of the best in the world. So it would be very, well, not, nothing is easy in this context, but it would be relatively easy to vaccinate many people Uh, 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 speedily, and that didn't happen because the, the, uh, there was a long delay to buy the vaccines or to obtain them in, in some way or another. And of course, it was so serious that it is. It was. It's now the object of a special uh, commission of investigation in in the Brazilian Congress. I mentioned the shortcomings uh, that are due to the the way uh, the Brazilian government uh, conducted the, the policy, but of course there are other aspects that have to do with the whole system of production and distribution of vaccines. Uh, the, the idea that there, the, of this COVAX, which would be uh, conducted by the World Health Organization has been proven, well, has not proven to be effective enough because there's only a very few, uh, few doses that are available in that way. So uh, uh, it's really up for the rich countries to, uh, to, to, 
to to uh, that they are the countries that are benefiting more. And in what I I'm not a specialist, but what I read, some of them at least I don't know if they have already they are already in possession, but they have bought four or five times the size of their population. Uh, and of course, that is, is something that would be detrimental to the distribution of vaccines in general. So, uh, for the access, access to vaccines, you have two main aspects. One is the, and the two are linked somehow. The extent of production and the other is accessibility in terms of price. And for, for these two things to be uh, properly addressed, there is a very important initiative which India and South Africa uh, have taken, and then later on, even President Biden somehow supported. I don't know exactly how in the fine print it will be, but in any case, the fact that the President of the United States has somehow desanctified the idea that intellectual property is uh, is not is more important than, than, than human life is in in itself very important. And I think this is uh, uh, I think the way that we can proceed. I mean, you have to increase the production, uh, ensure that it will be, the distribution will be more equitable. But in order to have that also, there will have to be this flexibility, uh, and a kind of waiver on, 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 on intellectual property for a long time, especially because even the existing, there are flexibilities. I was personally involved in the negotiations of the Doha Declaration on Trips and Health, but it's still a very cumbersome process. Uh, and of course, very often you have a, a, it's almost a kind of cluster of patents which make it very difficult for you to have the, the compulsory license. So I think the, 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 the waiver is certainly the, the best way. And just to finish uh, this uh, question, it's not only a question of uh, equity, of course, this is very important, but of course, in a pandemic, if, if some countries are not free. Other countries will suffer also because we live in a world that's totally globalized in which you can build walls, maybe, uh, to impede immigrants from coming. Uh, you shouldn't, but you, you can. But I don't think you can build walls to impede virus from traversing borders. And I think in this particular case, we have to have South-South-North cooperation as well because maybe in some technologies, the North has already advanced a little more, and it is important to spread it in, in, in southern countries. And then, then they can cooperate in terms of uh, uh, using a broader market to make it uh, to, to, to lower the cost of individual production. So I think that there is certainly, for instance, the, the countries of BRICS uh, include uh, three uh, important producers of, of medicaments. And uh, in the case of Brazil, not so much important as a producer, but it's important with the technology of applying the vaccines in, in, in very, uh, and probably South Africa as well. So I think there is room for that. Uh, and I think it should be exploited more fully, but it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it doesn't uh, prevent us from looking also from some cooperation from the North especially in the more advanced technologies. There is this latest one that uh, uh, makes the vaccines more effective. I think we also really need to improve the international institution for, for, that, for that matter, because these are a, a, a very important subject, the, the global health, together with the climate change and together with inequality are the three main challenges for the world for the next decade. But this requires some change also in the institutional framework in which we live. नमस्कार मैं सुरेखा राज्य महासचिव आशा वर्कर्स यूनियन हरियाणा हम सब जानते हैं कि पूरी दुनिया कोविड महामारी से जूझ रही है और हमारा देश भी इस महामारी से जूझ रहा है और अब हम इसकी दूसरी लहर से 
सामना कर रहे हैं इस महामारी से जूझते समय हमने देखा कि आशा वर्कर्स ने अपना एक महत्वपूर्ण रोल अदा किया था इस महामारी को जब हम शुरुआत में जान रहे थे पहचान रहे थे और ये सोच रहे थे कि इससे कैसे लड़ा जाएगा और तब हमारे पास केवल एक ही साधन था कि हम किसी भी तरह से इसका बचाव करें और हम कह रहे थे कि इसका जो बचाव है वही इसका इलाज है उस समय पे कि जो कॉन्टैक्ट ट्रेसिंग का काम है या फिर जो जिन लोगों के अंदर लक्षण पाए जा रहे थे उन तक सुविधाएं कोई भी स्वास्थ्य की पहुंचाने का सवाल था उनको क्वारंटीन करने का सवाल था उनको मोहर लगाना या फिर उनके घर पे पर्चे चिपकाना हाई रिस्क लोगों की पहचान करना ऐसे तमाम काम आशा वर्कर्स ने उस समय पर किए थे और इस काम को आशा वर्कर्स के काफ़ी महत्वपूर्ण काम माना गया था कोविड महामारी के दौरान आशा वर्कर्स का कई घंटे का रोजाना का काम बढ़ गया है और जब वैक्सीन आई तो वैक्सीनेशन के लिए भी आशाओं के काम बढ़ गए और एक स्वागत योग्य कदम भी कह सकते हैं हम उसको लेकिन उसमें कुछ संदेह भी पैदा किए स्वागत योग्य कदम इस तरह से कि जब आशा ये वैक्सीन की शुरुआत हुई उस वक्त में कहा गया कि सभी फ्रंट लाइन वर्कर्स को सबसे पहले वैक्सीन दी जाएगी और उसमें आशा वर्कर्स का नाम भी शामिल था तो आशा वर्कर्स के दिल में दिमाग में तब एक सवाल आया और वो सवाल ये आया कि जब हमें महामारी से लड़ने के लिए हमें फील्ड में भेजा जा रहा था हमें मास्क नहीं दिए गए हमें ग्लव्स नहीं मिले हमें सैनिटाइजर नहीं मिले और ये जितना काम सात से आठ घंटे रोजाना का काम जो कोविड महामारी के दौरान आशाओं ने अतिरिक्त किया इसके लिए सरकार ने केवल एक हजार रुपये महीने की अतिरिक्त प्रोत्साहन राशि दी वो सरकार आशाओं को सबसे पहले कैसे वैक्सीन दे, शक, दे सकती है विशेषज्ञों की भी राय आ रही थी कि कोवैक्सीन जो है वो उसके ट्रायल थर्ड ट्रायल नहीं हुए हैं तो बहुत सारे लोगों के अंदर ये संदेह पैदा हुआ कि ये जो वैक्सीन आई है ये बीमारी पे काम करेगी या नहीं करेगी इन संदेह को दूर करने के लिए सरकार को जो काम करना चाहिए था उन्होंने वो काम बिल्कुल भी नहीं किया उल्टा दो दाब धों हमने देखा अब जब हम कोरोना की दूसरी लहर से जूझ रहे हैं और ये काफ़ी भयानक है और जो डाटा सरकार दिखा रही है या वो जो बता रही है संक्रमण की दर वो जो बता रही है और मौत का आंकड़ा वो जो दे रही है ये सच्चाई नहीं है और इससे कहीं ज़्यादा बड़े पैमाने पे लोगों की मृत्यु हो रही है और हम ये भी देख रहे हैं कि आशा वर्कर्स की भी इस दौरान सेकंड लहर में काफ़ी मौतें हुई हैं वो कोविड संक्रमित थी वो हॉस्पिटल्स में एडमिट थी उनका इलाज चल रहा था कोविड का लेकिन जब उनकी डेथ हुई तो उनको ये कहा गया कि इनकी डेथ का प्राइम कारण कोविड नहीं है ये इनके पहले से कोई और बीमारी थी इनकी हार्ट अटैक से मौत हुई है या तो जो फ्रंट लाइन वर्कर्स हैं उनकी ही गिनती यदि हम जगह नहीं पाते आ, आ, सरकारी आंकड़ों में यदि तो फिर और जो सामान्य मौतें हो रही हैं वो कैसे जगह पाएंगी तो ये अपने आप में एक संदेह पैदा कर रहा है और फिर इस दिशा में जब हम वैक्सीन की बात करते हैं तो वैक्सीन अब लोगों का रुख थोड़ा बदल गया है वैक्सीन के बारे में और अब वो चाहते हैं कि वैक्सीन लगे लेकिन अब वैक्सीन की अवेलेबिलिटी कम हो गई है अब वैक्सीन अवेलेबल नहीं हो रही तो ये इतना जो डर का माहौल और ये सब चीज़ें बनी हैं इसकी कई सारी वजहें हैं खुद जो सरकार का रवैया है और हम सरकार में कहें कि उनके बहुत सारे मंत्री संतरी उनके विधायकों ने और जो जिनके काफ़ी हम कहें कि आशीर्वाद है सरकार का ऐसे लोगों पे उन्होंने न केवल एलोपैथी का मजाक बनाया उन्होंने वैक्सीन का भी मजाक बनाया है और उस संदर्भ में लोगों का विश्वास जो है वैक्सीन पे नहीं बन पा रहा है खुद जो हमारे देश के अंदर अब जो भाजपा शासन में है उनके जो मंत्री हमें ये कहते हुए मिले हैं कि आप गोबर का लेप कीजिए इससे कोविड भाग जाएगा आप गोमूत्र पीजिए इससे कोविड भाग जाएगा बाबा रामदेव जी को हमने सुना कि उन्होंने वैक्सीन वैक्सीन का भी मजाक उड़ाया हमारे डॉक्टर्स का भी मजाक उड़ाया तो ये जो तमाम चीज़ें चल रही हैं इन्होंने वैक्सीन के संदर्भ में भी कई सारे संदेह पैदा किए हैं और इसकी वजह से 
दो समस्याएं हम हमारे देश में झेल रहे हैं एक समस्या तो ये है कि वैक्सीन के ऊपर लोगों का भरोसा नहीं है एक बड़ा ऐसा तबका है जो वैक्सीन लेना नहीं चाहता और दूसरा ऐसा भी बड़ा तबका है जो वैक्सीन लेना चाहता है लेकिन उनके लिए वैक्सीन अवेलेबल नहीं है इस हम दुविधा से आज के दिन गुजर रहे हैं और इस पर यदि सरकार कोई सकारात्मक प्रचार अभियान चलाए और लोगों को विश्वास में लेके समझाने की कोशिश करे तो हम इससे पार पा सकते हैं और वैक्सीन को भी यदि बड़े स्तर पे उत्पादन करके सब लोगों तक कम समय में सब लोगों तक वैक्सीन पहुंचाने की यदि कोई कोशिशें हो सकती हैं तो हम इस बीमारी से पार पा सकते हैं नहीं तो हम काफी मुश्किल महसूस कर रहे हैं और मुश्किल समय में हैं Hello, this is Yanis Varoufakis from Athens with a message to comrades of the Progressive International regarding the moral duty that we all have to vaccinate humanity to end the pandemic. I want to share with you two numbers. $9,000 billion. $9,000 billion, $9 trillion. This is the sum of money that the G7, the leading economies, central banks printed to give to the bankers during the pandemic between March of 2020 and today. $9,000 billion. Now for the second number. The International Monetary Fund has come up with an estimate of how much it would cost at the present prices to vaccinate the world using existing vaccines, to vaccinate everyone fully, two doses when necessary. $39 billion. So compare and contrast. $9,000, $39. They printed 9,000 for the bankers and they are still thinking about how to vaccinate the world that would cost only 39. We progressives, of course, never expect the central bankers of the capitalist West to produce the 39 billion, even though it would just be a touch of a button for them to vaccinate humanity. We do not expect such humanism from them. But comrades, it is essential that we broadcast from the rooftops the news for everyone to listen to, that they printed 9,000 billion and only with 39 they could have ended the pandemic for the world. Because only by demonstrating to good people out there who are not radicalized, who are not part of the Progressive International, who are not leftists, only by explaining to them that we don't need even to wait for socialism, for nationalization of big pharma, for big structural revolutionary changes. A tiny little move of one finger within the existing awful capitalism would have saved humanity from COVID-19 and they are not doing it. This is how we inject outrage in the hearts and minds of good people out there who are not radicalized yet. This is how we radicalize the world in order to be able to end the patent monopoly of Big Pharma, in order to internationalize, nationalize, socialize, call it whatever you will, big pharma, so that there are no more patents that prevent people from access to pharmaceuticals, vaccines, drugs, whatever is necessary, which is available in order to save lives. So let's do it all. Expose big pharma, big politics, the oligarchy for their lack of willingness to do even things that are consistent with their own awful system in order to save humanity, work towards ending the patent system, replacing it, for instance, with a price system. How about having a situation where we say whichever company produces a vaccine against HIV will give them five, ten billion, but not a patent. Then they will have to make the patent available to everyone. Support existing pharmaceutical companies in Cuba, in Africa that can produce vaccines today and start the process of convincing the world out there who are not part of the Progressive International that they should be part of the Progressive International, radicalizing them by means of this combination 
of, on the one hand, demonstrating to them life-saving changes that could take place even within this global techno-feudalism, as I call global capitalism, and then harvest the ensuing anger in order to create the revolutionary progressive dynamic by which we're going to change the world, vaccinate everyone, and provide the basics to everyone that needs them. Thank you. Quiero saludar la iniciativa de la Internacional Progresista por convocar a una cumbre por el internacionalismo de las vacunas. Esta iniciativa viene en un momento muy importante en el que eh, vemos cómo la distribución de las vacunas no responde a las necesidades de la gran mayoría de los países del mundo. La pandemia, sin lugar a dudas, ha puesto en evidencia la forma en la que funciona el, el, sistema, el modelo neoliberal, el sistema capitalista, que concentra las riquezas, los bienes y los servicios de alta calidad en un puñado de países y que metabólicamente, intrínsecamente, está incapacitado para resolver eh, no solamente eh, la pandemia, sino también las amenazas globales que tiene que enfrentar la humanidad. En este periodo de un año y medio de pandemia, hemos visto cómo eh, no solamente la distribución de, de vacunas, sino de otros bienes para atender la, eh, la pandemia, han estado subordinados, sometidos a la lógica neoliberal, y hemos visto de manera palpable cómo eso eh, se cobra en vidas eh, humanas en distintos lugares del mundo. Eh, el año pasado, todas y todos hemos sido testigos de cómo se han aplicado prácticas de piratería en pleno siglo XXI, cuando algunos países, solamente por su poder económico o su poder militar, se apropiaban no solamente de equipos de bioseguridad, sino también de medicamentos en desmedro de otros países. Conocemos numerosos casos en los que fundamentalmente los Estados Unidos se han apropiado de cargas eh, que iban destinadas a eh, distintos países con productos para eh, mitigar los efectos de la pandemia, con absoluta impunidad, solamente con el poder del dinero o la fuerza. Eh, y ahora, en estos momentos, después de casi un año y medio eh, de la pandemia, vemos cómo la distribución de las vacunas también pone en evidencia la forma en, que, en la que el sistema neoliberal funciona. El 75% de las vacunas se concentra en un puñado de países. Y como el propio director general de la Organización Mundial de la Salud ha afirmado, es inmoral, es criminal que mientras personas sanas eh, que no están en ninguno de los grupos de riesgo se vacunan en los países del denominado primer mundo, en el sur global, eh, mucha gente no solo que no se vacuna, sino que muere producto de esa división que existe eh, en la humanidad. Y quiero hacer énfasis en que el, en la pandemia nos enseña lo que sucede eh, con otros fenómenos de carácter social. A principios de, de este año, en enero, se registraban hasta 10.000 muertes por día por la pandemia. Exactamente la misma cifra de personas que mueren cada día por falta de asistencia médica, producto de otro tipo de enfermedades, enfermedades que pueden ser atendidas. Entonces, eh, tenemos que aprender muchas lecciones de, de la pandemia. En enero de este año, se ha construido un fondo humanitario para que los países del Caribe Oriental, que son parte de la alianza, puedan acceder a vacunas. Y se ha llegado a más de un 15% de vacunas en ese, en ese esfuerzo de la Alianza Bolivariana para los Pueblos de Nuestra América. Paralelamente, se han sentado las bases para la construcción de un banco de vacunas que nos permita 
por supuesto, abastecer eh, a distintos países de este bien tan preciado. Pero paralelamente se ha construido un puente aéreo que ha facilitado, por ejemplo, la llegada de vacunas desde China hasta eh, Dominica. Eh, en ese sentido, hemos avanzado en la posibilidad de garantizar que eh, la pandemia no haga tanto daño como en eh, muchos lugares. Por eso eh, reitero el, el saludo eh, a esta iniciativa de la que tienen que salir propuestas concretas. Nosotros estamos muy esperanzados en el hecho de que los candidatos vacunales de Cuba, un país miembro de nuestra alianza, también alivien a paliar la difícil situación que se enfrenta en muchos lugares del mundo por la, eh, por la distribución eh, de las vacunas. Eh, y además de enfrentar la distribución que es fundamental, es también imprescindible llevar adelante una campaña global que nos permita desbaratar esas contracampañas para que la gente no se vacune. Porque si algo, además, y con esto concluyo, tiene que enseñarnos eh, la pandemia, es que vivimos en una comunidad global, con un destino común, y que solamente nos salvaremos cuando todos estemos eh, protegidos. Y lo mismo sucede con otros fenómenos como eh, la lucha contra la crisis climática, contra la, dis, eh, la desigualdad, la disrupción tecnológica, en fin, contra el modelo neoliberal. Muchas gracias. Olá pessoal, tudo bem? Eu sou o Antônio Lisboa, secretário de Relações Internacionais da CUT Brasil. Quero cumprimentar aos organizadores e organizadoras dessa conferência por iniciativa tão importante. Nada é mais importante nesse momento para o mundo do que a produção e distribuição das vacinas para toda a humanidade. Nós sabemos que a produção de vacinas, a descoberta de vacinas para a Covid-19 em tão pouco tempo, são um êxito da humanidade, né? um sucesso da ciência. No entanto, a produção dessas vacinas em tão pouco tempo foi possível em função de recursos de governos nacionais, pesquisas em universidades, muitas vezes públicas, e, portanto, são um bem da humanidade. Não podem servir como uma commodity a serviço das grandes farmacêuticas do mundo inteiro. Portanto, a democratização das vacinas é fundamental. E para isso, em primeiro lugar, nós defendemos a quebra das patentes das vacinas, para que todos os países que possam produzir vacinas produzam. Em segundo lugar, que seja feita a distribuição justa dos insumos de produção da vacina e assim a gente possa fazer com que a grande maioria da população, especialmente dos países mais pobres, possa ter acesso a essas vacinas o quanto antes. Nós não podemos utilizar da, do resultado da ciência, que, como disse, produziu em tão pouco tempo vacinas para combater a pandemia, como um bem que vai gerar mais concentração de riqueza e mais eh, desigualdade no mundo. A quebra das patentes, portanto, é fundamental. Nós queremos que o mundo volte a uma normalidade, mas não a normalidade que a gente tinha antes da pandemia, que já era de um mundo injusto, desigual e que não respeitava o planeta. Nós queremos uma nova realidade para depois da pandemia, com um mundo justo, em que as pessoas possam viver tranquilamente em todos os cantos do planeta. Por isso, a discussão sobre a democratização e distribuição das vacinas se torna tão importante nesse momento. Grande abraço para vocês, sucesso no evento.
Greetings. I'm Zeni Triunfo Cortez, a registered nurse and president of National Nurses United. NNU is a co-founder of Global Nurses United, an international federation of nurse and healthcare workers unions in 29 nations around the world. GNU members are on the front lines as the virus rages across the global south. So far, less than 1% of vaccine doses have gone to low-income countries as wealthy countries hoard 85% of available doses. Many GNU nurses still lack access to personal protective equipment, tests, and treatments. They, along with billions of their patients, family, and community members, could have to wait two years or more to get vaccinated. This vaccine apartheid is completely unacceptable. Not only will it cause immense and avoidable suffering and death in low and income and middle income countries, it will prolong the global pandemic by allowing dangerous new variants to spread. Nurses know exactly who to blame, big pharma and their political allies. The truth is we can vaccinate the world now. Global South countries have the capacity to manufacture and distribute COVID-19 vaccines, but pharmaceutical companies are blocking them, spending millions on lobbying to preserve intellectual property barriers, even though COVID vaccine development was largely publicly funded. No one should die for drug company profits, especially during this pandemic. We applaud the Biden administration for announcing the US will support a waiver of some provisions of the World Trade Organization TRIPS agreement to bolster production and equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. This is a crucial step toward ending the pandemic but it's not enough. Several wealthy nations still oppose the TRIPS waiver and the current December deadline for a final waiver text is far too late. We need a waiver now. For decades, we've been told that only the free market ensures efficiency. Now the global pandemic brings the very concept into question. In fact, it has shown that profit-seeking markets cannot adequately mobilize the medical resources required to save lives, protect vital and already stretched public health services, and stop economic collapse, leaving millions destitute. The state must take responsibility. For years I have been researching Cuban development. Since last year I've been writing about Cuba's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite being a small Caribbean island blockaded by the United States for 60 years, Cuba has used its planned economy and public health care system to harness its resources and expertise to protect its own population from the coronavirus while also sending brigades of medical specialists around the world to, com to treat COVID-19 patients. By the 5th of June, 1.75 million Cubans had received a first dose of a domestically produced vaccine and the whole country should be vaccinated by the end of 2021. Within one year of the pandemic, 57 Henry Reeve brigades of Cuban medical specialists had treated 1.67 million COVID-19 patients in 40 countries. Now, Cuba reacted 
decisively to information about the SARS-CoV virus coming out in January 2020. And before the first case was detected on the island, they set up a national commission and a national action plan. They sent Cuban specialists to China. They reorganized their medical facilities and trained all staff. The medical science sector was directed to develop COVID-19 tests, diagnostics, treatments and vaccines. This is particularly important because US sanctions blocks Cuba's access to international markets. Once the first case was registered, they began door-to-door -door health checks, testing, contract tracing, and set up isolation centers to quarantine those with symptoms or returning from the island. Anyone was COVID, with COVID was treated in hospital. They introduced a strict lockdown, which was backed up with financial support and welfare protections to the population and closed their borders. They drew on community mobilization and communication. Now, there are five features of Cuban development which help us to understand Cuba's response to COVID-19. The first and most important is Cuba's single universal free public healthcare system, which seeks prevention over cure, with a network of family doctors responsible for community health who live among their patients. Cuba has the highest ratio of doctors per capita in the world. Second is Cuba's entirely state-owned biopharma industry. There are no private interests or speculation. It's channeled to meet public health needs and produces between 60 and 70% of the medicines consumed domestically, and it exports to nearly 50 countries. Cuba Biopharma has adapted and produced new treatments for patients with COVID-19 and developed five domestically produced vaccines with more in the pipeline. Third, their experience in civil defense and disaster risk reduction. Usually this is in response to climate related and natural disasters. Cuba has an internationally applauded capacity to mobilize national resources to protect human life. This is achieved through a network of grassroots organizations which facilitate communication and community action. Fourth, their experience with infectious diseases and border controls. Since 1959, six diseases have been eliminated in Cuba through their vaccination program. Cuba has a well-developed procedure for quarantining people who are entering or re-entering the island. And this was developed as Cuban healthcare professionals travel to countries to serve underserved populations which have infectious diseases eradicated on the island. And for the foreigners from those countries who were invited to Cuba to study or for treatment. And fifth, Cuban medical internationalism. Before the pandemic and since 1960, over 400,000 Cuban healthcare professionals have served in 164 countries. When the pandemic began, Cuba had at that moment 28,000 healthcare professionals working in 59 countries. On the 21st of March 2020, when Lombardy in Italy was the epicentre of the pandemic, a Henry Reeve brigade arrived to give them assistance. Now, in all these aspects, Cuba has faced one major obstacle, and that is the United States blockade or embargo. This has been ongoing for 60 years. Sanctions are not a bilateral matter. They are extraterritorial, affecting Cuba's trade with the rest of the world. The total cost of the blockade is ca calculated at over 144 billion. And that is 3.27 billion just as an impact for the healthcare sector. The Trump administration added over 240 new measures, actions and sanctions to make the situation more difficult for Cuba, including 50 during the pandemic. From April to December 2020, the Cuban healthcare sector suffered losses of $204 million due to sanctions in the context of the pandemic.
The US blockade obstructs Cuba's access to ventilators, spare parts, reagents, medical equipment, including syringes needed for vaccination. Even international donations are blocked. On June the 23rd, the United Nations General Assembly will once again support Cuba's motion to condemn the US embargo of Cuba. And yet there is a lack of will to confront the US over its punitive and extraterritorial sanctions. So what can we take from Cuba's response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, Cuba spends a tiny proportion of what Britain and the United States spend on healthcare. Despite this, by planning their scarce resources, they have been capable of organising an effective response to a global pandemic. The key to Cuba's performance has not just been the fact of state intervention, it is the nature of that intervention. Cuba's socialist system is set up to prioritise social welfare, not private profit. Now that may not be a lesson that other nations are ready to hear, but Cuba's international assistance during the pandemic at least shows the benefits of global cooperation and solidarity for addressing global problems. So we uh, are uh, one of the uh, uh, many, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, companies that have been uh, contracted to produce uh, the Sputnik vaccine uh, and uh, the Russian firm uh, um, RDIF, uh, which uh, owns the technology uh, or licensed technology from uh, Gamalaya, uh, has uh, enabled this access to uh, Sputnik technology uh, to our firm as well as multiple other firms. Uh, we are still in the process of, uh, of uh, adopting this technology uh, and we receive very active support uh, from the RDIF team uh, in order to um, uh, enable uh, the production of that particular uh, uh, Sputnik vaccine here at our site. Um, so we hope that uh, uh, we would soon be able to um, reach up uh, to complete uh, completing that whole technology transfer and then producing this particular vaccine. In the initial uh, uh, stage, we did reach out to uh, a few of them, uh, both local as well as uh, international. Uh, there has not been a, a revert um, uh, at that point of time. Uh, so the first uh, one that we actively uh, engaged with well, has been uh, um, have been the the, the Russian firm, uh, and uh, that, that's why we started off with the Sputnik one. Um, subsequent to that, there have been some uh, um, um, talks with uh, others who have approached us, but they're still in uh, very early stages. So we at um, uh, uh, Virco Biotech um, have uh, biological manufacturing capacity, which uh, essentially shares the same uh, underlying, uh, um, you know, technology uh, suit uh, requirements uh, for vaccine production, and uh, we would be uh, open to, um, uh, you know, sort of produce uh, vaccines using these suites uh, if uh, technology access were enough. I'm Deborah Berger, RN and President of National Nurses United. We call on the Biden administration to work to convince every WTO member nation to agree to an effective waiver as quickly as possible. The waiver must also extend beyond vaccines to include PPE, 
diagnostic tests, treatments, ventilators, and other crucial medical supplies. And it should be of sufficient duration to ensure that we can meet global demand and end the pandemic. The Biden administration should immediately direct American companies to share their technology and manufacturing know-how with producers around the world, and the U.S. should lead other wealthy nations in immediately scaling up vaccine production and massively increasing donations abroad. And then you nurses know it'll take collective action on a mass scale to get the protections we need and ensure an equitable end to the pandemic. In the last year, we've organized over 3,000 protests and industrial actions to force our employers and our government to give us the protections we need while caring for our patients and our community. Just as we fought tirelessly to protect nurses in this country, NNU and GNU will continue to pressure our home governments and work together across borders until everyone in the world has access to COVID-19 vaccines, testing, and treatments free at the point of service. We stand in solidarity with healthcare workers, patients, and their communities worldwide, and we pledge to fight alongside progressive unions, activists, and political leaders gathered at this summit, because we know that none of us are safe from the virus until all of us everywhere are safe. Thank you. Fortunately, there is a decline of coronavirus in Pakistan. Less than 2% of those tested for corona are affected by this uh, uh, pandemic. And this is not the result of the government policies that uh, they have effectively controlled as the present government is claiming. This is the consciousness of the people who have come to this conclusion that they have to go for the vaccine. Initially, there was hesitation among the people on the advocacy of the religious people to go for vaccine. We as uh, Pakistan Kisan Rapta Committee, Hakuk e Khalq Movement, we had the first webinar attended by hundreds to campaign for people's vaccine for all in the initial stage and the government has to listen to us. Initially, this government allowed private uh, uh, laboratories to import the vaccine and Pakistan was the first country to do that and we campaign against it we held press conferences used social media and used all our trade unions peasant organizations meetings to campaign against this private usage of the vaccine we demanded government must treat vaccine as they have treated the polio drops because they were providing free of cost the polio drops and the other vaccines. Why not this one? And also we said in our uh, campaign material that this pandemic is not a Jewish pandemic, not a Christian or Hindu pandemic. It is a virus. So we have to treat it as a virus. It has nothing to do with the religion. So we fought against the religiously dominated ideas on coronavirus. At present time, 10 million people have been vaccinated in Pakistan. And fortunately, government under the pressure of groups like us has opened up vaccine for all and free of cost. But they don't have the required numbers of doses for vaccine. It's a 200 million population and only 10 million has been vaccinated. And they plan to go for 70 million 
people uh, by the end of this year that they did not buy vaccine they did not put any money for that they just were waiting for donations and they spent all the money on on uh, non development expenditures they paid uh, the debts uh, and it was criminal act to pay over 7 billion uh, us uh, dollars as repayment to the imf and other financial institution during the coronavirus period they paid 25% more debt than they did uh, the last year we know very well that the rich countries has bought all the vaccine and they have bought more than what they need and they are not thinking about the world they are thinking under the circles of nationalism they want their own national vaccine and we want an international vaccine that's the difference of approach we have with the heads of the state of the rich countries who do not care about the people of the world and that's where progressive international must campaign with full force to go for an all out vaccine for all in the world it will be good if corona vaccine is given free of cost to all the countries like pakistan to the countries of africa and asia who cannot afford to buy and stop taking loans from countries like pakistan we are demanding at least 4 years of suspension of all debts so the money could be used for health for public health for all if government has no money the rich country has the money they should spend that amount on providing vaccine to the whole world vaccine is not confined to uh, national boundaries they are at mistake if they think that if britain and us and australia and canada can control corona virus in their national boundaries they are safe no it is not safe because initially they said china it is a chinese thing and you see then how america was affected by this corona virus corona is international we have to reply internationally Uh, South Africa is ranked 19th in the world on the uh, COVID Worldometer Index uh, by cases. Uh, we've previously been in the top 10. Uh, we are ranked 14th by deaths, although uh, research suggests that we are recording officially only possibly half as the the total number of deaths attributable to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when we come to the vaccine rollout, however. South Africa is ranked 79th on the world indexes and only 0.8% of the population fully vaccinated as of the 8th of June. Now the reason for the slow rollout are many. However, one of the reasons why the campaign got off to a very slow start was that the multinational big pharma companies that produced and supplied the vaccines all demanded indemnity and that the government establish a fund to deal with any litigation that may arise right now as we are on the cusp of a potential third wave of covid infections the the issue is simply the non availability of sufficient vaccines to uh, increase the pace of the rollout what we have seen is is that the big pharmaceutical companies which were making a slow withdrawal from the production of vaccines because they were not considered profitable in the past suddenly moved in to produce these vaccines with public money uh, allocated to them to to begin the research and now sitting with hugely increased profit margins this is the world of of profits before people of profits driving 
the distribution and rollout of vaccines. One of the uh, issues facing the African continent, one of the lessons which you've learned, is that Africa can no longer afford to be in the situation that it's in now, where 99% of all vaccines administered are fully imported. Africa does have production capacity, mostly in the area of generics and mostly production under license uh, of uh, by multi uh, under under license given by by multinationals. But there is also innovation taking place. And I think that there is an emerging consensus on this continent that in the future, we have to develop our own production capacity. An opportunity arises for us to do this from the African continental free trade area, which if we are able to develop this in such a way that it supports the emergence of regional value chains, could allow cooperation and the emergence of value chains producing a whole range of pharmaceutical products. One of the impediments that we have to come to terms with in achieving this is the existing intellectual property regime. These intellectual property rights, as they are now structured, are supporting and allowing extensive monopoly conduct by big players and by big pharmaceutical companies in particular. They allow these companies to decide on the basis of profit decisions whether to supply or withhold supply from particular jurisdictions. They allow them to apply price discrimination. They allow them to choose or not to choose uh, any, any uh, partners that they may wish to link up with in the production of vac vaccines. And they also allow extensive abuse of the system through arrangements like evergreening, which allow patents to be rolled over in perpetuity by making very small adjustments to them. All of this is underpinning this uh, situation that we have now. So South Africa, along with India, uh, championed and began a process of calling for a, a, a waiver, a temporary waiver actually, uh, on uh, the TRIPS uh, uh, obligations uh, for the production of, of vaccines. I'm happy to note that the TRIPS Council a few days ago agreed that this would now go into text-based negotiations. So I believe it's important that we support this call, but we also be very, very vigilant about what I call two Ds, delay and dilution. We cannot allow that to happen. We also need to realize that if we do achieve this uh, important objective, and we do get the TRIPS waiver through in a form uh, that is uh, sufficient to support uh, at least uh, some uh, initial response to the, the COVID emergency, then uh, this needs to be followed, I think, by a much more thorough and systematic examination of the patent system, uh, which is allowing uh, monopoly conduct. So the quest has to be to put people before profits and not allow this vaccine apartheid, which has emerged from the existing regime, which is putting profits before people. Thank you very much. to listen to our participants these last few hours. In a moment of shared crisis, where we're witnessing nationalism, imperialism, and racial capitalism all play out in the most grotesque of ways in the vaccine race, it gives me immense hope and joy to hear your words. On behalf of the Council, Secretariat, and all our members of the Progressive International and our audience, I thank our participants and our delegates, vaccine manufacturers, healthcare worker unions, government ministers and political representatives coming to us from all around the world. For your message, vaccine internationalism is how we end the pandemic. As our delegates said, not only are we focused on resolving vaccine access in our countries, but strengthening the foundations of a world order that will not allow such injustices to occur ever again. 
Over the next two days, we will be discussing and deliberating how to abolish the vaccine apartheid. To abolish it, everything must change. From nationalism to internationalism, from charity to solidarity, from competition to cooperation. This summit is the first step of this journey of transformation. Thank you for joining us.